I was watching this uh, presentation by Robert Sapolsky. And it was uh, like a graduation day address at Stanford University. I guess he was talking to recent graduates. And it was about the uniqueness of human beings. What it was to be unique, you know, what it was to be human, what separated us from uh, other animals, particularly primates. Robert Sapolsky is a, I don't know if he's a primatologist, but he talks a lot about primates and worked a lot with gibbons, I think. But he's also something to do with neuroscience. And uh, he went through a list of the, the uh, well, the usual candidates for uniqueness. I'm just trying to remember what they were now. Uh, he was talking about aggression and how sometimes it's said that, you, that humans have a unique capacity for human-on-human um, -human aggression, and he demonstrates that that's not true. That happens in the primate world quite a lot. Uh, he talks about theory of mind, uh, and again, it's often claimed that humans are the only species with theory of mind, and he presents evidence to say that isn't the correct. Uh, and then some kind of moral sense, particularly the golden rule, and as he seems to, that seems to also exist in the animal kingdom, even quite low down the what we think of as low down the animal world. Relatively simple creatures have something like the golden rule going on. I think he cites vampire bats in that one actually. And then he talks about empathy uh, as a possible candidate for uniqueness, for demarcation, demarcating uniqueness, and he indicates that that's not the case. Um, and deferred gratification, how the willingness of humans to, to do something unpleasant with the hope of something pleasant happening later on as a result of that. And again, he, he provides evidence to show there's nothing unique about that. Uh, and then finally, culture, uh, which he says you know, other animals possess. He says in all these cases, humans have taken those basic forms and done very elaborate Baroque things with them. But the basic building blocks of all of those capacities, as he says, exist in the animal world, and particularly in the primate world. So those aren't, um, those aren't unique properties of humans. The only thing unique about them is what humans do, but that's nothing special. And then he says there are unique things that humans do, and he mentions in passing language and communication, of course, and also uh, our unique sexual behaviour, the fact that we have non-reproductive sex and we don't have seasons and those kind of things. Um, but the one he dwells on, which is um, one that I haven't really resolved in my mind yet, is to do with our ability, he says, to hold contradictory propositions, contradictory beliefs possibly, in our minds simultaneously. So we seem to be able to hold contradictory beliefs simultaneously. And not only that, but he claims that we are able to kind of draw strength from the contradiction, it, it, suggesting that the more something is indicated as not being true, the Frame more... It whoops, there it is, he's playing the background. The more, um, the more likely something is not to be true, the more investment we make in believing it. We kind of draw strength from its implausibility. And he cites Kierkegaard, and I've got the quotation he's got from Kierkegaard on the screen in front of me here. And he's talking, Kierkegaard's talking about Christian faith. Sapolsky isn't couching it in those terms at all. He's an atheist, but he cites Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard says this, Christian faith requires that faith persists in the face of the impossible and that humans have the capacity to simultaneously believe in two contradictory things. So this, this it's fortuitous I came across this, really, because this harks back to something I was thinking about a few days ago, about the, the kind of oddness that I find with certainly some religious faiths in that, um, in that more evidence that is produced which contradict what the, what the beliefs, the tenets of that faith are, the stronger that faith is held on to. And it's kind of considered to be a moral good, or not just a moral good, but a, a kind of social, personal good, to, to hold on to faith in the, in the teeth of contradictory evidence. And, uh, and one's ability to hold faith in, the, in those circumstances is, as I say, considered a good thing. And, and Kierkegaard seems to be identifying that. Christian faith requires that faith persist in the face of the impossible. And Sapolsky is saying the same thing. Not only does it persist, but it draws strength from this impossibility. Whew, I don't know what to think about that, really. I mean, Sapolsky is talking about it. I mean, it's a closing day address when he's talking to graduates. So he's bringing this in. Um, as a as a kind of 
way of sending out graduates into the world. It, it, it's, it's a kind of pep talk that it's giving graduates who, once they've gone to university, will often feel that they, you know, what can they as individuals do to, to change the world for the better when everything seems, when it seems so impossible. And Sapolsky is, is kind of suggesting that the very impossibility of, of, of one person changing the world kind of paradoxically is the site of, um, a, of increasing determination to try to change the world. So you draw strength from its very impossibility. Um, or, or that impossibility validates the attempt or validates the, the belief that it's possible. I don't know where I'm going with this, really. I mean, I, I, it's just something that interests me right now, because uh, I've always considered the, that, you know, the hanging on to a belief or faith or a practice, really, in the face of contradictory evidence is uh, anti-rational. It's the opposite of rationality. Um, and, and I still kind of think that. But I'm just wondering if there's any mileage in this uh, in this suggestion that Sapolsky makes after Kierkegaard. You know, is there any validity at all in, uh, in yeah, and just what I just said, really, in trying to hang on to? Oh, I don't know. I mean, when I, when I go through it in my mind, it just it it it, it just resolves into um, foolishness. But there might I don't know. Maybe I'll keep thinking about it. Maybe there is a way of. Um, uh, of, of using it more interestingly, I mean the 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 reference that Sapolsky gives, apart from Kierkegaard, the, the kind of human example he gives, is of a, I guess she's a, a nun, something like that, somebody called somebody Prejean, but this uh, religious person, she ministers to uh, inmates on death row in a, a prison in America. I can't remember the name of the prison. Now, I'm not really sure what ministering means, if I'm honest. But either way, she presumably goes and talks to them and tries to make them feel better. But uh, these people, uh, according to Sapolsky, are you know, amongst the most um, dangerous and difficult people to recognise as human in the world. They've committed the most heinous crimes, the most deplorable, disgusting, devastating, repulsive crimes imaginable. And this woman goes in there and talks to them in whatever way she does. And she, and according to Sapolsky, she is asked, you know, how can you do this? And she says uh, something like, um, the less forgivable the act, the more one must work to forgive it. And then the follow-up is, the, the, uh, the more unlovable the person, the greater... The need to find a way to love that person. That's not quite right, but it's something like that. The idea is that you, you that yeah, yeah that, that's pretty much it. Really. And the nearest example I've got from from my history is uh, Lord Longford, who uh, was a, a lord in, in 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 Britain. He's dead now, I think. But he campaigned for many years for the, if not the release, then certain kinds of better treatment to Myra Hindley who was um, one of the, what's called the Moors murderers, who, was, who her and her partner, Ian Brady, killed a number of children in the 1960s, quite near where I used to live, actually, which is where I was brought up in, uh, in Lancashire. And, uh, and obviously she's universe, pretty much universally hated and demonised, and is a kind of iconic figure for evil, in the, in, certainly in the UK. And, uh, and Lord Longford, for years, went to visit her in prison, and as I say, a campaign for for a certain kind of not I don't know not forgiveness, but a certain kind of more human relationship to her. And and he was widely uh, chastised for this, castigated, and and, uh, and people couldn't understand it. And uh, and I suppose that fits in the same kind of category that I'm talking about here. It's a little bit like the act of this this nun, whatever she's called, somebody be Prejean who goes into prisoners on death row. But the more unforgivable the act the the more important it is that one works to forgive it the more unlovable the person the harder one it's necessary that one works to find love for them and and holding those contradictions in mind and drawing strength from that contradiction allows one in those particular cases to behave in a way which i find uh, morally um, 
well, just morally amazing, actually. I do, I do find that morally amazing that those people are able to do that. Um, yeah, that's it, really.